Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Um, we're very happy that um, you've joined us today um, or that most of the people are here already. I guess there will be still some joiners throughout the first couple of minutes. Um, but yeah, welcome to the masterclass um, series um, that we're creating um, this peak season, basically, to prepare e-commerce retailers for um, the upcoming holiday peak. Um, as you know, there are five sessions planned every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Um, the first session today is together with Textu um, and Courtney, uh, who will be um, discussing today the case of international VAT compliance, especially relevant for cross-border e-commerce. Um, so hi, Courtney. Happy to have hi. you here. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Great. Um, yeah, so basically, um, just to give some basics about the format, um, so we are hoping to make this very, you know, informal and um, to have a lot of questions from the audience. So feel free to already post your questions in the Q&A section. Um, our team will already be answering some of the questions in the background. Um, and at the end of the session, we'll also come back um, to some of them. Um, so yeah, really feel free to ask whatever you're interested in. I think especially with all the changes that are happening in with regards to VAT, there's a lot of things to still, uh, you know, ask about. Um, and uh, we will also be asking a few questions to the audience in the form of polls. So please also feel free to participate so that we know kind of, you know, who's in the audience and how we can make this even more interesting for everybody. Um, so yeah, um, that's, that's it. Um, again, the topic, um, I think super relevant for every online retailer out there who's planning or who's already acting in an international way when it comes to e-commerce. Um, there's a lot of regulations out there and there have been some recent changes with the introduction of IOSS and OSS. So um, I think super relevant topic and very happy to have Textu and Courtney on board here. Um, just a few words maybe um, about me. So I'm um, Petra, uh, CCO at BERT, um, have been kind of, uh, in the e-commerce space for a few years now and mainly focusing on helping e-commerce retailers with their fulfillment. Um, yeah, and handing over the word to Courtney uh, to introduce yourself. Yeah, hi. I mean, my name is Courtney Pullen. I am the country manager UK at TaxDo and I have several years experience with um, international account management, international sales and I've been at TaxDo almost a year now and um, really into that VAT sort of Brexit, OSS, IOSS. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, we don't want to, you know, spend too much time on this, but um, again, just to make everybody aware of what the different companies are doing. Um, so text is basically the expert in VAT topics when it comes to e-commerce. Um, so, you know, if you have any questions about this, I guess Courtney will give some really good insights already. Um, but they have really cool software in the background as well that can help you automate processes. So, yeah, feel free to, to check the website. Um, and uh, BIRD, as I mentioned, is an e-commerce fulfillment network. Um, so we help retailers with their um, logistics uh, across different countries in Europe. Um, and yeah, so that's why we've partnered up, right? Our customers and tax to customers, I think, have very similar needs. And um, yeah, so hopefully this will be interesting for everybody. Um, and with this, I think I will hand over directly to Courtney um, and to start with uh, basically her, her topic and um, yeah, the agenda. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, as I said, I'm super excited to be here. And today I am talking about, you know, um, cross-border sales, the challenges about cross-border sales, but also international VAT compliance. Um, I think that's super important, especially for everyone here. If you are dealing with cross-border sales and the OSS and all of those new regulations in the peak season, I assume a lot of you will be having an influx of sales, which means sales perhaps coming from or going to uh, countries that you don't normally send or ship to. And that's why we've got this agenda set up for you today. Um, so we have the challenges of cross-border sales and fulfillment. So just looking at, you know, okay, well, what are the new regulations? What complexities are there coming with these regulations and what is specific to cross-border sales and what is specific to fulfillment? Um, after that, we have the one-stop shop, of course. Um, just having a look at how that works, um, what you need to know, what you need to be aware of. And then we have a look at automating VAT compliance processes. Now, tax do 
Um, our goal is always to automate the processes as much as it is possible. And here we can just show you, you know, what areas can you automate and what would be sensible. After that, of course, ask me anything and uh, Q&A. So any questions you do have, please um, write them in the, in the question um, section <laughs> and we'll get to them later. Uh, so with no further ado, uh, let me begin. Um, so we have here sort of the challenges of the cross-border sales. And I think it is important um, going into this to understand sort of the difference between regulations. As I'm sure all of you are aware, you know, July 1st, 2021, saw the uh, biggest EU VAT return, sorry, <laughs> VAT reform. Um, and here we have sort of a few different um, regulations. So before July 1st, we had individual uh, distance selling thresholds for the whole of Europe or all EU member states, which meant that um, you know, up to 35,000 or 100,000 euros, um, you had a threshold. And if you exceeded that threshold with your cross-border sales, uh, then you became tax um, liable in the country of destination, were required to register for tax and to uh, submit local VAT returns. That has now changed. As of July 1st, 2021, the, these distance selling thresholds have been eliminated and there is now an EU-wide 10,000 euro threshold. So what that means is for all cross-border B2C sales, so all distance sales, um, you have a 10,000 euro limit. And once you exceed that limit, you become that liable in every uh, destination country to which you send even one parcel. So what this sort of means is that if, for example, you send um, 9,999 euros worth of um, goods to or sales to, um, you know, if you're in Germany sending to France and then you send from Germany to the Netherlands, you know, 10 euro package, that's it, you're over the threshold and you are now um, tax liable in all of the destination countries. So what that means is there is a difficulty now in keeping track of these cross-border B2C sales, especially um, if you are using fulfillment, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, it's difficult to keep track of that because you need to filter your, um, you need to filter your sales. You need to filter what is local and what is cross-border. And then these cross-border sales need to be included in that OSS, uh, that return. So what that again means is that we have uh, parallel comp compliance structures. So you not only have to be um, submitting all of these VAT declarations, you also have to have OSS declarations. Again, this means filtering your different transaction data, filtering your sales and understanding, okay, you know, what is OSS relevant and what needs to be uh, submitted locally. And um, important, I guess, in that or beyond that is understanding the tax rates as well, because you are that liable in all of these destination countries. You do actually need to use the correct tax rates throughout Europe. This is incredibly important when we're looking at uh, reduced tax rates as well, understanding that each country has a different uh, or could have a different tax rate. And you need to apply that on all of your sales, all of your cross-border sales. So those, you know, in summary, are the, the challenges of cross-border sales. Really, there's a huge part in understanding that you need to filter all of your sales so everything gets declared in the correct VAT return and via um, the correct way. And then if we move on to um, our challenges of cross-border fulfillment, here, um, you know, it does sort of come, it does tie in with this, this concept of this, the cross-border sales and the difficulty there because you do really need to understand that you have to have all cross-border sales uh, declared via the OSS. So what that means if you are using cross-border fulfillment is that um, you need to have the sales that go from all of those different fulfillment centers. So if you, for example, are located in France and you have fulfillment centers that are in the Netherlands or um, in Germany, et cetera, and they um, send, send packages for you, cross-border, then those sales actually need to go into the OSS. They do not need to be declared locally. However, the regulation um, as it was before, which meant that you become that liable when you warehouse in other countries is still relevant. So what this means is that for foreign warehouse usage, you are that liable locally. And this means you need to submit ongoing uh, VAT returns in these uh, you know, respective countries. And in these VAT returns, it's very important you need to um, include your intra-community movements of goods, your B2B sales, your local B2C sales. All of these different types of transactions, all of these different types of sales need to be done locally 
again, not via the OSS. OSS is only for cross-border B2C sales. And this is why you need a digital solution for the automatic evaluation and, and filtering of your transaction data so that you can see you know, um, which sales need to be declared via the OSS, which sales need to be declared locally. Um, to do that manually, of course, definitely possible. Uh, I don't know how many sales you have, but I would assume probably it's more than is manually very possible or feasible. And that's why it does need to be a digital solution. You need to automatically know exactly what you have to declare because you want to avoid declaring sales in, via the wrong avenue or not declaring sales at all or declaring sales um, sort of double. So that's what we're trying to avoid. And that's sort of the challenges that you're facing. So we have the challenges of the cross-border sales. It's recognizing which sales need to be um, declared by the OSS. And we have the challenges of cross-border fulfillment, which gives us this, you know, um, the, the, um, the two different ways. So we have our, our parallel compliance structure. We have our local VAT returns. We have our OSS VAT returns. And that sort of gives just an extra layer of complexity, especially because, you know, that 10,000 euro limit it's not that high. Most people are going to um, exceed that limit very quickly, which means tax liability in all of these countries in the EU. So moving on from that, um, have a little look at how the one-stop shop works. Um, so basically, there's a few things that have become a little bit more simple. And um, one of those is, of course, here, we just have one clearing office. So that means that all of these cross-border sales, again, from every fulfillment center that you have, anything that's gone cross-border, that can all be declared and submitted centrally via the OSS in your resident country. And that means you just pay one sum and then um, you know, the, the relevant uh, tax authority is just going to distribute your VAT or your due VAT um, to the relevant countries in which it is due. And um, part of that is that you have to return these um, or you have to submit these returns uh, quarterly via your local OSS, um, which means that you do have to have three months time in collecting all of this transaction data, all of the sales data, putting that then in um, the, um, the VAT returns and submitting that via the OSS. And I think at this point, it would actually be quite interesting if we did a poll just to see how many of you, um, you know, have faced any of these challenges or are involved in cross-border um, sales, just to see how many are actually affected um, by this. So that'd be great. It is in the polls now. Um, so if you head on over, that would be fantastic. Um, but to continue on about the OSS, again, um, we have a payment deadline that's one month after the end of the reporting period, which simply means, um, for example, we have Q3 is going to be the first the first quarter in which you can um, submit uh, your returns to the OSS, which means that you have until um, the end of October. So up to Halloween, you have time and uh, can pay your due VAT. Then we have um, another thing which is made, um, you know, it's a little bit different under um, the new regulation and that is there is no more obligation to issue invoices. Um, so you're no longer obliged to do so. Of course, if your customers would like that, um, you may. Um, but that's definitely saving saving the trees. <laughs> and corrections, of course, have been made a little bit easier. So all we have to do with corrections now is um, just include them in the uh, next or current or consecutive um, OSS declaration, which means you simply just um, identify what period needs to be a correction made and um, include that in the VAT return um, but by the OSS. And that's the way it's done. So that's obviously made things a little bit easier. Of course, it's different to local um, returns, but uh, the one-stop shop has made cross-border um, sales easy to, to submit, easy to declare, and of course, paying that debt has become centralized. So I think the next and most interesting thing is how we're automating these VAT processes. Obviously, we've seen, you know, what needs to be involved, um, but here we can see, you know, what, what aspects can be automated or what we're doing. So First and foremost, we have our data collection. Um, this is very important, of course, because we need to have all of that transaction data. We need all of that raw data, nothing to do with any of these um, you know, invoices. As we all know, invoices can sometimes be wrong and we don't want that, especially when dealing with the tax authorities. So we have our data collection in which um, you, can automate, you can automate that section. So all of that goes straight into a system like TaxDo, for example. 
Um, and then we have just that evaluation and monitoring. So then you can see where exactly your um, transaction data needs to be declared, where your sales need to be declared, where your B2B sales need to be declared, et cetera. You can have also that calculation so you know exactly how much due that you have and where. Um, beyond that, of course, important is OSS submission. So for everyone that does exceed that 10,000 euro limit and is registered via the OSS, um, we have these submissions and then the local VAT, 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 <laughs> local VAT declarations. And these are very important, of course, if you are using fulfillment centers in and throughout Europe. Um, you are required, of course, because you are VAT liable to um, submit these ongoing local declarations. So here, um, you know, again, it's this compliance structure and you're trying to get that um, as automated as possible. And for example, tax to allow just the um, automation of this process. And it's something that is important, um, especially when dealing with all of these different declarations, these two different compliance strands. And last but not least, we have our financial accounting and documentation. Um, of course, I assume a lot of you are working together with a tax advisor and who doesn't like to have everything automated and sent to the tax advisor for him to have a happy life. Happy tax advisor, happy life. So um, obviously something that's very important and getting all of these transactions or transaction data into that format so it can be worked with. Um, again, working in e-commerce and having so many sales as a lot of you I'm assuming do, um, it's just too much for manual arbeit. It's too much data, it's too much to go through and you want to avoid any manual mistakes at every level that you can. And this is just sort of that compliance strand or this automating VAT processes that you need to be aware of the different levels, I think that you can go through to you know, collect that um, data, to evaluate that data automatically, and then what happens with that afterwards. So that's you know, automated cross-border e-commerce processes sort of in a nutshell. Um, we have our challenges, we have um, the OSS, and this is sort of, you know, the last step where the automation comes into it. And uh, that's all for me for the moment. Um, but I think we'll go into the AMA and see, you know, what kind of questions are coming um, and, you know, how, how I can help beyond that. Perfect. Yeah, let's do that. Maybe one information before that. So um, basically the result of the poll, I think it's not too surprising, but 83% um, percent of um, the the participants today are either selling or storing cross borders. So that's great because I guess this Perfect. is highly relevant um, for them. Um, so before, I think um, there are no questions yet. So really feel free to, to ask them. Great. The first one, first one just came in. But as, as mentioned, I think we have some kind of frequently asked questions that Courtney, um, you know, hears all the time. So we, we thought we would start with those to kind of um, repeat a little bit what is what is kind of always on on the mind of, of e-commerce retailers and when you were telling us uh, Courtney kind of about the differences between local VAT and OSS you know like this is also for us always a topic um, just kind of understanding the differences when is when do I need what um, so maybe can you summarize um, for us what is uh, when do I need OSS and when do I need to use iOSS Mm -hmm. What are the what are the, the use cases for those two um, yeah the numbers? Perfect. Yeah, of course. I mean, the OSS you need to use um, as soon as you've reached that threshold, or as soon as you've exceeded that ten thousand euro threshold. If you're selling goods, you know, um, even throughout Europe underneath that that threshold, then it doesn't apply. You can continue just using the tax rate of the um, of the country in which it um, it begins or has initiated the sale. However, as soon as you um, exceed that threshold, then you do become tax liable and you have two options. You can either use the OSS or you can register in every country to which you send something and submit local um, that returns. So obviously, probably you know, very time consuming. OSS is going to be exactly OSS is going to be um, the obvious choice in, choice in that situation. So as soon as you um, exceed that threshold, and IOSS, I um, haven't spoken that, I just might say a sentence or two to that. So the IOSS is important if you are, um, for example, um, if you have, um, you know, a warehouse in a non-EU country, if, for example, you have a warehouse in the UK, and from that warehouse, you're getting parcels that are, sh that are sent over to the EU, um, that's when the IOSS comes into play. So that means you can register just like the OSS for the IOSS, and all of these parcels up until, um, you know, that have an intrinsic value of 150 euros, 
um, they all get sent over to Europe and you don't have to worry about, um, you know, import VAT or, or VAT on those. Um, so that's the IOSS and the IOSS is always important or it should definitely be used um, when you do have a, a warehouse outside of the, uh, outside of the EU. Mm -hmm. So, for example, for, for the UK, I guess this is hybrid. For the UK, yeah. Or Switzerland is also one, you know, um, just for those singular packages. Yeah, definitely. And just to be clear, the 10,000 euros, that's basically an annual limit, right? So Correct. Something that an online shop is very, very likely to, to exceed very quickly. It's not monthly, it's annually. Exactly. So that's an annual. And that actually means that if you do... Um, if you do exceed that limit, um, you do have to, you are um, that liable for the consecutive year. So basically, um, you can pretty much assume that once you have exceeded it once, you're continually going to be over the limit and can always assume um, your tax liable in the other, uh, in the destination countries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, great. And maybe then moving on, kind of, you mentioned, um, you know, uh, the, the tax liability in the different countries. So do I always have to declare the tax rate um, of the destination country that I'm sending the, my products to? Correct. So, I mean, up until that limit, obviously before, um, you know, if you've not reached the 10,000 euro limit, it's not relevant. However, as soon as you have exceeded that limit, you'd always have to use the tax rate of the destination country. So basically I need to know ideally in an automated way how the tax system or how the tax rates work in the country that I'm shipping to. Um, so basically, as I imagine it, you know, in a shop system, there would be no way to do this manually, right? You would need to have some kind of database or something that tells you in real time what the tax rate should be. Exactly. So we're looking at, I mean, there's, there's a few different ways of doing that. Um, obviously, you know, tax do offer that uh, fully automatically. Uh, however, um, what we need, there is databases available online. And um, what you need to know for that, though, is also the um, customs tariff number of all your products. And that way you can figure out what the tax rates are for all of those EU countries. Um, and then you can apply that um, manually. But it's definitely... Um, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of work. It's a lot of countries. It's a lot of tax rates, especially when looking at reduced tax rates. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I'm still not sure. You know, like it's supposed to be a a way to to make lives easier for e-commerce retailers. <laughs> I'm not, not quite sure um, if it's really making everything easier. But yeah, I think maybe it's a it's a first step of of getting there in general. Yeah, I think definitely. Uh... <laughs> A first step is a good way to describe it. Yeah. And um, maybe because we, we talk a lot about fulfillment, obviously, on our side. Mm -hmm. So let's assume I have, a, I have a warehouse in France. I'm a German retailer, but I use a warehouse in France. Um, when do I need to declare my sales in France in the country where basically I only have my fulfillment? Okay, so basically um, with the fulfillment, as I said, you are tax liable immediately once, once you need to register for tax, you're tax liable, which means you are required to um, submit local VAT returns. So what that means is you need to um, submit your local VAT returns monthly and um, included in the, those VAT returns are going to be your intra-community movements, your B2B sales, your local B2C sales, and all of that needs to be done, um, you know, monthly according to um, VAT law in, in France in this uh, situation. And then your OSS sales, obviously, only once a quarter. And so this is basically what you described as the parallel next to the OSS, what needs to happen locally anyway. So for every fulfillment country that I use, I still need to have the local setup with the local um yeah correct and everything yeah and that can change you know you can have monthly quarterly you can even have of course that um the yearly um tax return so there's a there's a few different setups there's a few different parallel sort of ways that you have to go and all of these um declarations have to be made um there's there's no getting out of it yeah yeah to be honest this is always the number one confusion amongst our customers i think this isn't really uh, super clear yet often that there's this parallel world kind of next to the OSS. Um, so we at least um, always try to bring this up very, very early because otherwise, um, yeah, if you're not aware and in Germany, it take, takes sometimes three months to get the VAT number. Mm. Um, so we need to really, yeah, uh, make, make customers aware of this. Um, great. Okay. Um, we have a few questions already. Maybe one last one, because I thought it's very interesting um, that, that you actually mentioned could, um, could be a good topic here as well, um, is what happens with returns, right? So 
how does it work? Where do you file them? And especially, I think there's this case of a return is being shipped out from one country, but then being returned to another country. Um, I imagine this must be crazy for, for your tax. Um, <laughs> how, how does that work? Um, yeah, that's definitely a question that I've heard before and it's um, sort of confusing at the beginning, but it's actually a really simple answer. And um, all of these returns are just included in the, um, the current OSS return or in the current OSS declaration. So all of that, you know, especially even if it is going to, um, I'm, for example, someone, uh, I'm located in Germany, someone in France has, you know, bought something from me, it's gone there and it's, it's been returned back to Germany. All of that is included in the OSS. Um, so that, that kind of makes it easy, kind of makes it simple, uh, you know, something that's not as complicated as um, one would have one would have thought. Yeah, that's, that's definitely easier than expected. Yeah. <laughs> um, great, then I would suggest we move over to the, to the live questions. Um, I can see um, our team is basically already replying or also um, Madeline from, from Text2. Um, so I'll try to take maybe one question that hasn't been answered yet. Um, so Sebastian is asking, how is the OSS system um, applicable to my Amazon sales, as I do not know where Amazon is storing my merchandise? Um, I mean, this is a really interesting question because, yeah, with Amazon and you using, I would assume, FBA, so you don't actually get the information between, you know, where your goods are being moved between warehouses. But um, the OSS system is applicable for all of your, um, you know, all of your foreign sales. So I would assume with Amazon, you do get um, a transaction list where you can see all of your sales. And through that, you would have to, if not using something like tax to um, manually go through all of these different transactions. And then you would have to filter them so that you could, um, you know, have your OSS documentation and create all of that for submission. Um, it's regardless of whether you can see your uh, you know, the movements of goods or not. It's still um, just the B2C sales. Um, what would be interesting in that sense is, um, you know, looking at um, these movement, the warehouse movements, because they need to be, they need to be, um, they need to be submitted in local, local VAT returns. Um, this is something that Taxi can help with. Um, this is something that we, that we deal with um, quite a lot, especially um, Amazon FBA. So basically, if I understand correctly, every intra Amazon movement would have to be submitted as an intra community transfer as well. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that sounds like a lot of work too. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can automate that, but uh, yeah, I imagine manually it's, it's definitely, um, you know, it's quite, quite intricate, quite complex. Yeah. 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 Cause I think they really move, move products around quite a lot. So mm -hmm. um would be would be quite challenging okay well no, really really interesting question um there's a question from chan um i'll try to because it's a bit longer um so there's double vat charge for the customer vat during purchase and vat on import how to approach approach the double vat charge how to report it for oss um the customer pays vat to get the package contact contacts us do we just refund the VAT we charged or do we need to report this during the return? That during purchase and for, uh, on import, I would assume that would be, I mean, that would be sending packages from a non-EU country into uh, the EU um, because there's no import, I mean, there's no import that obviously on sales that are, that are happening in the EU. So I'm going to assume um, we're talking about packages that are coming, you know, outside. So that would be, um, that would be, if it is an import of goods on the, in the sense of just package single parcels being sent to customers from a non-EU country, for example, like UK, um, then there is the IOSS, um, which is where we, you know, up to 150 euros, um, that's going to cover that. Otherwise, um, with the, with the VAT on, um, on parcels that are above 150 euros in value, um, there needs to be, it's still the same regulation, so there needs to be a um, VAT registration in the country of destination and there needs to be a submission of local VAT returns. Um, however, if, if, this is, if this is a, I mean, that's, that's talking about someone that is, uh, you know, an EU company that just has a warehouse in the UK. If we're talking about a, a, UK, um, yeah, a UK company that are selling goods online and um, 
and they're selling um, via a marketplace and the marketplace is responsible for that. So they should be um, taking care of that as there is a new shift with all of these different, you know, regulations or the new regulations that have been um, coming into force. Um, that shift of that liability is actually being moved from the, the actual sellers onto the marketplace and a marketplace is sort of being um, considered the seller in that sense. And that's why um, generally there shouldn't be a double a double charge of VAT that should be taken care of. Yeah, I guess for some questions, it's also a bit difficult to... Yeah, it's... it's one minute. <laughs> so maybe, um, Chan, you know, if, um, if you want to, I guess there would be some more information needed also to answer properly. So um, we'll show kind of the contact details at the end of the session. So feel free to reach out um, to, to Courtney later on or to text me in general. Um, yeah, I think it's always like that with... Um, some questions are commonly asked and then there's some more specific cases where more information is needed. Yeah. Um, great. Um, there uh, was another question. Basically, do I need to get a VAT number first to get an IOSS number? Um, uh, yeah, there, all, there was also a question back from Madeline um, if that re is referring to the country that you're based in or another country. I guess that also makes a difference. Mm, yeah, exactly. I mean, if you are an EU EU company and you are registering for the IOSS, you should already, I mean, you would already have a VAT number um, for the country in which you're register, uh, you know, resident of, and that's how you would get the IOSS. And if you are, um, you know, a UK customer, for example, um, that, that would change. I mean, you don't, you don't need a VAT number, an EU VAT number. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So, exactly. Sorry, I was, <laughs> I was just reading, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So coming from Hong Kong, um, I guess as a non-EU company, um, you, um, yeah, I'm not sure what what the the reply is there. If you would still need a local VAT first to reply uh, to apply for the IOSS or not? I can see that Madeleine is replying now, so I might just leave that one with her, um, and then. Um, I saw a question, though, that I thought was quite interesting as well, uh, if I may. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, um, just, you know, how does it work for BDC transactions from the EU um, to the UK? And what does the seller need to do from a VAT perspective? I think that's super interesting, especially just that um, concept of UK. So there's a few um, different situations in the way that that is handled. So um, obviously, if it's a sale of up to an, like, with an intrinsic value of up to £135, um, and it is sold over a marketplace, the marketplace is actually responsible for, um, for the VAT. So the, the EU um, seller does not have to, um, is, there's no registration or anything in the UK, they can just sell with the um, German or EU tax rate. If, however, these sales is um, low value, so up to £135 um, going over to the UK, if that's done on a shop, for example, then um, the seller needs to use the British um, tax rate in the, you know, in the sale. They need to then be registered for tax in the UK and they need to submit local tax returns. If, um, however, the, um, the sale is over £135, then um, there is import VAT on that sale. And if customers or if sellers are using um, postponed VAT accounting in the UK, then, um, you know, they can, it's delayed. They don't have to pay it at the border. They can then include that in their local VAT returns. And that's sort of the difference um, in there. That's sort of what a VAT perspective is. I hope that helped. Great. Um, then I think we have answered um, all of the questions we have here. Maybe one more point from my side, because I always thought it was interesting that, you're not um, required to generate invoices anymore. Yes. Um, what does that mean in practice? I mean, I guess customers would still want an invoice for their purchase. How, um, how can this be interpreted? Yeah, exactly. It's sort of a little bit um, of a, a new concept, but you're not required to have invoices anymore as um, part of the OSS regulation which just means that, um, you know, if your customers don't want one, then you don't, have to, you don't have to do it anymore. However, if your customers do want to have an invoice, then that's fine. You are able to still create invoices, send invoices, um, just make sure that, um, you know, it, it's wanted by the customer, I guess. But now it's just something that you're not, you don't have to worry about. It's sort of one of those things that has made 
made selling a little bit less complex because it's just one of those things that you you know one less thing to do i suppose um however if customers do require or would like to have an invoice then of course um that's something that you can still do yeah i i guess it depends maybe a bit on the on the country um mm -hmm. culture a little bit um but i guess at least speaking for the german market i would imagine that customers would still Especially for high price products, I guess it, that also plays into the whole Definitely. equation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I can't, can't imagine German uh, culture shifting so much that they, they don't want to have an invoice. Uh, <laughs> but we'll see. Who knows? Yeah, I think that might take, take a few years still. <laughs> the OSS is sort of allowing for that shift now. So maybe it will become trendy, but um, it just depends. Yeah, um, great. Maybe we give it still one more minute in case any any more questions um, pop up. Um, and then I think um, you know we just have some some um, more information to, to share with you about um, Textu and the upcoming um, sessions. Um, but I, I will just um, maybe wait a little bit in case anybody still has um, a question that um, they want to ask. But I guess there's there's nothing more. So um, thanks everybody for for participating. I hope this was um, helpful. Um, we have basically some um, contact data collected here for you, so that um, you can reach out to to Textus team. Um, as mentioned, you know some questions might be might need a little bit more context and and information. So um, that's why I think it makes sense to to kind of. Um, reach out to text to and, and ask in more detail. Um, yeah, Courtney, any, anything to add from your side? I guess um, you're responsible for the UK, right? So anything that is UK related is, is best um, to reach out to you directly. Um, but yeah. maybe in general, like what are the focus areas of text to? Is there anything, you know, are there specific countries or is it just all of Europe plus UK um, that you're covering? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, so I'm I'm for the UK, um, but I still help um, a lot of a lot of European um, sellers. That's definitely not only um, UK based, but um, our customer base is European. So any any EU member state, any seller in one of those member states can ha come um, to us if they have any questions. And you know, as I said, our focus is definitely on automating these VAT processes, making sure that VAT compliance. You know, become something that's a lot easier, a lot um, quicker, and less you know room for manual error. Yeah, yeah, I think it will only become more complex in the future, not less complex. <laughs> Anything you can automate in e-commerce, obviously, in general, um, is definitely is, um, saving your time. Um, perfect. Um, oh, there's one question that just came up. I guess we can take that one um, still. Um, Courtney, so Jersey and Guernsey are part of the UK and EU, but they have different VAT rules. So what VAT rate um, should we should we be applying for um, for the above two areas? I'm not sure if, um, yeah, if you know that um, directly or... Off the top of my head, um, I'm not sure. I would have to just um, double check with that, unfortunately. I don't, um, I don't have Jersey and Guernsey in that rate in my put in my head <laughs> uh, I apologize but um, I can definitely um, if you want to get in touch with me then I can double check for you and um, give you that information afterwards great perfect um, then let's let's do it like that um, and yeah perfect I think Madeline also shared um, your your email um, so feel free to reach out to to Courtney and um, that being said, I would just wrap up very quickly. Thanks everybody for, for participating. Thanks so much, Courtney. It was great having you. Um, yeah. I have to say, I've heard this a couple of times, but every time I hear it, it's, it's becoming a bit clearer to me. So um, yeah, it's, um, there's so, so much information, um, I guess, around the OSS and IOSS that um, I imagine, um, yeah, there's, there's still a lot of, um, a lot of questions that might come up after the session. Um, so yeah, anybody who wants to reach out, please do so. Um, and um, FYI, next week we're having a session um, again at five o'clock um, talking about uh, sustainable packaging. Um, you know, sustainability is also a topic that 
is be becoming more and more relevant in e-commerce. Um, and my colleague Sinem from Bird will be moderating um, together with um, Magda from Pack Help and discussing the, the topic. Um, so please join uh, if you're free. And yeah, that's that's it from our side. Thanks so much um, for um, being here. Thanks so much, Courtney. And yeah, I hope we um, see each other again soon during another webinar or maybe a live event. If yes, thank you so much. I had so much fun. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.